So for this drawing, mm-hmm. uh, do you have a way prepared to do it, or do you want me to do it? Yeah, I actually already did it. Ah, okay. But we can do it again if you don't think my method was suitable. I'm sure your method was perfectly suitable. All right. Well, here's what I did. Uh, firstly, I um, sorted the subreddit comments randomly twice and then grabbed the top name, the top comment two times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I looked at, I pulled up the screen of retweets from the, the Twitter and just did a random number to generate it to grab a name out of that, put those three names in a list and then used a random number generator again to select one of those names. So if my uh, <laughs> procedure is correct, then that would have given the Redditors two chances, like we said, and the Twitter users one chance. Uh, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it gave the one Redditor that was picked two chances. It gave the one Redditor that was picked two chances. Huh? Right? Because you said you picked the top one and then you you doubled it up and mixed no, it No, no. I, I, I sorted the subreddit twice mm-hmm. by random. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So we had two, two Redditors and one Twitter out of that. I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I mean, there could have been the same Redditor twice selected, but it happened that it wasn't. Right. So I'm not sure how mathematically perfect this procedure was, <laughs> <laughs> but I also don't think we have to be 100 percent scientific either. No, I think I think that is that's good and fancier than the method I was going to go with. So. Oh yeah, were you going to do the close your eyes and run a finger across the screen? Because I <laughs> contemplated doing that. I got a bunch of scraps of paper in a hat. Okay, uh, this user said the functionality that opens up. With AirPlay getting cracked, is so awesome. It's a shame that Apple keeps it on lockdown, but I would be curious for Apple's reasoning here. All right. From Sounds user... Like the basement work. Basement work. That's the one. All right. So, happy 50th show. Fireworks. Uh, crackers. Crackers? Party, party poppers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and happy AirPods Pro to basement work. Man, that's exciting. Um... Are you going to go ahead and send a note, or do you want me to send a note? Uh, you can do it, since you're going to have to coordinate the postage and whatnot anyway. Mm, that's fair. So, I'll I'll get a note put together and sent after the show. I'm not going to try to do it right now. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, this person might be an Australian. I'm just seeing that they've got a few comments. Actually, no, they're, they're active in the Houston subreddit. Mm. Hmm. Well, that might be easy subreddit. to get to. Houston, yeah, you could practically um, drop it off yourself. <laughs> it would probably be six, six hours. hours. Yeah. <laughs> what a guess. That's How awesome well do guess. I know my geography? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually, uh, when I was in well, holidaying in North America a couple of years ago, I had to do the drive from uh, Houston to Tulsa. So I know roughly that distance. And it's a roughly twice that distance to me. Oh, what? I'm pretty sure. I thought I did that in that six hours, though. Well, maybe I'm crazy. Hmm. Let's see. Maybe I'm crazy. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, you know, I probably did like the scenic route, if there is one, and stopped a lot, though. Seeing as it was a holiday. That's possible. Tour, Let's road see. trip type thing. No, I, I was wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm i right in that it's twice the distance to Tulsa, but it's a good... Between 11 and 12 hours, depending on which route you take. Oh, okay. okay. Man, it's a long drive. So, happy 50th show. I can't believe it's already been 50. Mm. It has gone past in an instant. It's more congratulations to you, since you're the, the genius behind the whole thing, the one that put the show together in the first <laughs> place. Why, thank you. <laughs> it's good to see my... Genius status acknowledged. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain child has now grown to the age of two and survived mm. this long. Yep. <laughs> and props to you for sticking around for all I, this time. I'm just happy to find someone who likes talking about Apple as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started with four and, uh, as expected, shrunk down. Mm-hmm. Um, but... 
kind of not as expected, it's still going because I'm not sure that I thought I would find even one random person on the internet to, to talk with me fortnightly for two years. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that, that we've kept this up and hopefully it is a long future. <laughs> yeah, it all started from a random post on the Apple subreddit as well. Yeah, yeah, it did. And now here we are. We should find that post. What did I even say back then? That would have been a good thing to put in the show. I'm sure I could still find it. Oh, yeah. What would I search for? Who wants to start an Apple podcast? You could just go through your post history. Yeah, that's really long, though. Do you post a lot? Uh, Enough that it will take a while to find it. I'm certainly not going to be sorting my top. Hang on. Submitted. (laughs) It won't take that long, surely. I could definitely just jump back in my comment history and find your post. That's going to be even worse, though. I don't comment very Uh, much. Oh, okay. I'm on page four, and I'm at one year ago now. Okay. So, I'm looking for around two years ago. Still one year ago. Um, All right. I'm at show 008 when I posted it. Can't be far from here. Show four. Okay. Maybe one more page. Show three. Show two. Uh, hey, R slash Apple, we made a podcast for you with 50 upvotes. <laughs> All right, maybe one more page. Show one. Now I'm just scanning in one by one in case I miss it. Riveting podcast material right here. <laughs> I'll definitely try and crop it down. I don't know. Maybe I've passed it. Or I submitted heaps around the two-year mark. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Ah, found it. Uh, oh, wait, no, no, I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. With eight upvotes submitted, is there a date? 31st of December, 2017. Looking for two people to start an r slash Apple podcast. Hi all, is anyone interested in talking about Apple on a fortnightly basis over Skype? discussing the top posts in this sub for the last two weeks and other Apple news that didn't make it, if that's possible, will be the aim of the podcast. You would need the ability to make a Skype call and record the audio locally, blah, 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 blah. Leave a comment if you're interested or if you have any input on the idea. Uh, And how much feedback did that post get? uh, We had 28 comments. Oh, wow. Yours was, I'm definitely interested, exclamation mark. And I said, can you DM me your iMessage address? Yeah, we had uh, <laughs> uh, the serial vapist. So, David, mm-hmm. he joined in for a few months. And then Lord Mythoclast. So, that's um, Christian who joined in for a few months as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was the, the the obvious person, the obvious comment saying, don't, I'll tell you why. Do you know how many Apple podcasts there are? Uh, <laughs> I debated with him briefly. And was actually downvoted <laughs> for debating it with him. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Well, we, we showed him, I guess. We, we sure showed him. How many I wonder if he says it's not going to be going in a few months. Hang on. Uh, I'm not trying to dissuade you. I'm just saying that far too many podcasts have simply been abandoned. Mm. People are far too busy these days. Yeah. Well... I think I think if 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 me with with four kids and and you with one and another on the way can manage to keep this together anyone can do it. Yeah, exactly. So that sounded like a tweet from Anchor cuz they're always <laughs> tweeting stuff like that. Oh, are they? I'm not I don't follow mm. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I stopped after a while cuz it got a bit much. Just like inspirational stuff about how you can be make your own podcast too. Yeah, any mum can start a podca- podcast, that sort of tweet. <laughs> yeah. So, well, and for those anyway. that believed in us, now we got free AirPods for the basement guy. <laughs> Base work. <laughs> Base work. Base work? And it's B, wasn't it? I don't know. Something with basement in it. Oh, sorry. It was basement work, but basement, uh, base spelt with Two S's, not B-A-S-E, so... Bassment. <laughs> Perhaps you would pronounce it Bassment. Whatever. Perhaps he plays the bass in the basement. 
while he works. Or the bass, if if that's how you, and he and he works. <laughs> or he's a fisher. Yeah. Yep. Could be fishing for bass. Well, they can do that with their new AirPods Pro. Although I heard that they seem to slide out of everyone's ears. So I wouldn't do that while I was anywhere near water. <laughs> I I saw that post saying that over time, the the rubber uh, starts to wait, fit wait, to wait, your wait, ear. Wait. And we have an AirPods post to actually talk about. Do you want to save it till then? Okay, that works. <laughs> That's the whole reason I put this AirPods post in there, so we can talk <laughs> about the the um, tip gate. Tipgate, is that what they're calling it? That's what I'm calling it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Well, should we just jump straight into Tipgate? <laughs> sure. As it's famously called. <laughs> From now on, famously called. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if that had been assigned to it already. Um, actually, that's not completely what this topic's about, but we'll get to Tipgate. Uh, the topic is that... AirPods to hit quarterly sales of $4 billion, surpassing peak iPod sales. The quarterly sales of $4 billion. That is truly insane. Uh, although that number is a little bit of a guess, because to arrive at that number, uh, well, first they looked at, uh, what was it, wearables and home as a, um, a reported figure from Apple. Mm-hmm. And then they minused the um, estimated Apple Watch sales. And that's how they arrived at AirPod sales. Right. And we can just assume that HomePod sales are zero. So everything left over is Apple Watch or uh, HomePod, AirPods. <laughs> oh, poor HomePod. <laughs> it's just too expensive, I think. I agree. Especially with, you have things like the Google Home Mini that, that Google just gives away. Right. Yeah. Every man and his dog has a Google Nest Mini. Right. I'll correct you there. <laughs> because they seem to be just, like, thrown at you when you walk into a retailer of electronics. Okay. Especially you have to bring a shield with you. They're coming so, so thick and fast. <laughs> and if you have any subscriptions to anything, Spotify will send you a free one. If you're a Google Fi member, you'll get a free one. I just saw an article the other day saying that YouTube premium subscribers are slowly getting offered free Nest Minis as well. Mm. So... Well, my telco has a rewards program and they said oh, two Nest Minis for uh, 15,000 points and just the fact that you subscribe to their rewards program got you 10,000 points already. So, yeah, they're basically giving them away for nothing. Wow. This really uh, surprises a lot of people, I would assume, considering how many naysayers the AirPods had when they were first announced a few years ago. I would say, Yeah, that. but they're perhaps even more wrong than like iPad naysayers or iPod naysayers. I mean, every category that is announced has naysayers, doesn't it? But that's yeah, true. But certainly had a few. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to to have ever guessed that something that is just a small accessory could see quarterly sales at, at four billion dollars. Something that yeah, you really <laughs> you really can't buy unless you already own other Apple products. Someone in the comments said that, like, AWS as an entire business is either half or double AirPods. Either half or double? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what they said in the comment. <laughs> oh, quick, control F, AWS. <laughs> Sorry, that's my Windows pass coming back. <laughs> I don't even have command F because I'm on an iPad. I just command F to 8, eight no, no, I didn't. There it is. Amazon's AWS Lambda. No, that doesn't say anything. Uh, the next one down. Uh, the entirety of AWS is only twice the revenue of AirPods. Man. That was from uh, Trillic. And then Superior Array says AWS is the internet, basically. <laughs> and AirPods is half the business of it. Alone. Right. Yeah. Do you remember? This is probably maybe almost exactly two years ago. AWS went down for like a couple hours and like half of the internet was just gone. I don't remember that. Mm. Maybe it was more of a US thing. I'm not sure exactly where it was affected. Could have been. But I know um, I couldn't even do my my job because like the servers on a company used were all gone. <laughs> so, uh, And I think Amazon has like an SLO that they'll pay you or refund you money and AWS goes down as well. That's how confident they are in it. 
Right. So that was an expensive day for Amazon. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> um, I think, I know we haven't talked about this yet, but I actually have some new AirPods, but they're not AirPods Pro. Really? Yeah. How'd you come across those? Happenstance. A friend of mine bought some second gen AirPods and then less than two weeks after he bought them, he lost them. So he bought himself another pair of AirPods second gen Mm -hmm. and then just, uh, I don't know when that happened. I think when they first came out, whenever that was. Uh, and then just a couple of weeks ago, he found the first set he'd bought and used for barely two weeks. I think tucked in his car seat, somewhere like that. Uh, uh, so he offered them to me for an excellent price and I grabbed them. Okay. So combine that with the, the fears of the AirPods Pro tips, which I think if you go back and listen, that was my major fear with the AirPods Pro was the tips fit. Um, mm. And I, I think I'm pretty happy with the second gen AirPods for now does it have the wireless charging case no it doesn't unfortunately mm. but i oh, that's another topic but i don't sure if wireless charging is long for this house the the one wireless charger that we that i got uh for my for yasmin uh-huh. she's already found a reason not to use it which oh. is not a reason i would have anticipated okay. uh, but it is a valid reason <laughs> um so it's next to the bed and uh, she uses the vibration alarm on the phone to wake her up. Like, she doesn't want to have an actual audible alarm because okay. everyone's in the room. Uh, and she doesn't sleep so heavily that she needs an audible alarm. I mean, saying that the vibration is audible, that's how she wakes up. But uh, it's not like a tone coming out of the speaker. Um, the vibration of the phone on the floor is enough to wake her up. But the vibration of the phone... On the wireless charging mat is not enough to wake her up. Uh oh. So she's gone back to regular charging. So now I have like a hundred dollar wireless charger that no one uses. <laughs> Man, and you get that nice like fabric one that you'd found in the Apple Store and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's so nice. Hmm. Does so, uh, does she have a an Apple Watch? She doesn't. No. Mm. Honestly, I think the Apple Watch has a vibrate to wake feature that she could try using as well. Mm, yeah, maybe I should solve the problem by getting her an Apple Watch. <laughs> yeah, spend more money so that you can use the thing you already <laughs> spent money on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's almost Christmas. It's the perfect time to be coming up with ideas. Yeah. <laughs> perfect time to find more ways to spend money, not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as far as the the concerns about the AirPods Pro tips it seems to be a little up in the air about exactly what's going on at least as of what i had last seen which is probably earlier in the week um i wish i saw still the post but it seemed to be to the to the effect or at least implying that uh the the tips eventually kind of fit to your ear and then they would slide out because they they weren't pushing against your ear as much um but i had seen in the comments that uh that it seems maybe more of a case that like oils are getting on the tips causing the slide out. And if you take the time to like wipe the tips off, they, they stick a lot better afterwards. It sounds exactly like what the previous Apple wired in ear earphones did for me at least. Oh really? Is that, yeah, the, I'm not sure if it was oils, but they would fit pretty well to start with. And then slowly over time, they would get worse and worse at staying in your ear to the point where every five minutes you kind of had to push them back in, which isn't the most comfortable of processes Mm -hmm. to make sure you had that, that fit. Otherwise they'll just kind of sit in your ear like regular earbuds, which is not the point of having them at all. Right. So hearing this from quite a lot of people and they're saying that the, the ear tip fit test is, is failing as well. Mm -hmm. Like it'll work. And then the same ear tips will then fail a week later because of this problem. Right. Yeah, it does sound like a real problem. Maybe with the material that Apple's using. I don't know, it's just silicon or whatever. I did see uh, this feedback when the AirPods Pro were initially announced. A lot of people were disappointed there wasn't a foam tip option, which I I suppose is is supposed to maybe work a little better at avoiding this exact issue. Yeah, I've got a slight problem with the foam tips in that they do get dirtier. I mean, well, I mean, they both get dirty, but foams are much harder to clean Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, third-party options for the AirPods Pro 
probably already exist. And if they don't, <laughs> they've got to be coming soon. I mean, if they don't, it's it's three dollars for a whole new set of tips. Uh, I hopefully they're not failing at a fast enough rate that 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 price becomes, you know, limiting. But if you need one like mm. every six months or something, three dollars here or there, so your your AirPods fit better seems reasonable to me. Yeah, but I still shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to buy new new ear tips just because they're, I guess, badly designed. If, if this is what's happening, right? The best kind of ear tips that I've worn. I like a kind of like a triple flange design. Like they have a like a small ear tip, then a slightly bigger one, then one behind it. Kind of like oh, okay. I don't know if you imagine like a soft serve ice cream, but just like <laughs> three neat circles. Right, I'm familiar with the design. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, yeah they they seem to be the best that I've ever worn for staying in ear, but they also like the hardest to get in as well. Because they tend to go like a long way into the ear, and then getting them out is also a bit of a hassle. But yeah, hmm. so now I'm worried anyway about buying AirPods Pro. Right. Well, I guess if the if the regular AirPods suit you well enough, then it won't be an issue at all. They do suit me, but also they're no good on like a plane, which is right. where I typically use the in ear type AirPods. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> And you're definitely not going to buy them still. Right. Yeah, the in-ear headphones just aren't comfortable to me. And I have no desire to upgrade. On the AirPods sh- second gen, though, I do enjoy the Yo Siri command. That's very nice to have. Oh, right. Yeah, I forgot that was a new feature. And besides that, are there any other benefits? Um, not that I remember. It seems slightly faster at activating the microphone. That might be just a side effect of it listening for the Siri command. That's like always primed the microphone. Right. Um, but besides that, I mean, I certainly haven't noticed any improvement in All right. um, so, like the, the connecting part of things. Ah, well, the, the big advance is that it uses the H1 chip instead of the W1 chip. Mm, and yep. then everything, everything else is just what comes with that chip. So Yo Siri comes with the H1 chip. Uh, allegedly 50% more talk time with the H1 chip. And then uh, the last bullet point is it's supposed to be twice as fast at switching devices when you're going from your phone to a Mac or whatever. Hmm. I don't think I would have observed that. Yeah, I never... Although I haven't been scientific about the test. I certainly never thought the first gen was slow when I used those, so... Oh, really? Oh, well, I think it's slow as anything. Really? Horribly slow sometimes, yeah. At switching devices? Yeah. Ooh. Can take like 15 seconds sometimes. It's ridiculous. Well, it hasn't, that hasn't been my experience. I did have at the end of, of the first AirPods life, they started to really have trouble pairing and sometimes refused to pair at all or only one would pair, um, which I, I kind of attributed to maybe just bad batteries at that point. Uh, but mm, once I got yeah. the AirPods 2... Everything was back to the way I remember the AirPods 1 being when I first got them, which is I tap on them in my Bluetooth menu and I immediately switch to that device. So maybe I'm lucky. Hmm, yeah. I think we'd have more complaints, have heard more complaints if my experience was like the standard. So it's probably more that I'm unlucky. <laughs> unlucky twice over if, if you're having the same issues on these? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm having like 15 seconds, although I don't really use them with my phone a lot. So, and only ha- having had them for a few weeks, I don't have enough, uh, anecdotal data to, um, to really <laughs> complain yet. Maybe they are better. I'll report back in three shows time. Okay. Three shows. Okay. <laughs> three shows. Nail it down. 53. So the middle of February, we'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, 3D mask or a 3D mask or photo fools airport face recognition, but not face ID. From nine to five, Mac via some AI firm that uh, did a lot of testing with a um, a mask. Mm-hmm. They did it at uh, like mobile payment things uh, around China. I think it was China. At least that it was like from WeChat and Ally something Pay Ally Ally Pay. Uh, some, a few services that use your face to authorize payments, mm-hmm. um, a public transport system, uh, and even the face detection at Schiphol Airport 
as well, and all were fooled by a mask. But Face ID wasn't. Uh, apparently because Face ID looks for some sort of muscle movements in the face. Actually, the one at Schiphol Airport was just a picture, not even the mask. It's just a picture on someone's <laughs> phone. Uh, so that was enough to authorize entry into the Netherlands, apparently. <laughs> a little worrying. I, I don't think... Nobody hates the Netherlands. I don't think this right. is exactly news. I remember when the iPhone ten was announced and Apple was talking about Face ID, one of the very first slides they had up was the big wall of masks they used for testing Face ID to make sure it couldn't be tricked by stuff like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad it's being verified by third parties that that what seemingly appear to be fairly realistic looking masks aren't capable of uh, <laughs> fooling your phone. Uh, and that's that's probably a level of security more than I'm even worried about having because there, I don't think anyone wants what, what's on my phone enough to go out and make it like a very accurate face map of me. <laughs> so, Yeah, the article said that the making of the mask was quite an intensive process, which I can imagine because it looked quite good. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, you've got to be doing some like um, Mission Impossible level stuff to really worry about it. Right. Yeah. Although in the dystopian future that sounds like current day China where you pay for everything and authorize everything with your face, it's a little bit more worrying. Like one day are we going to get on the train and like have to look at a camera to uh, to authorize payment? That, <laughs> I, I don't know what that would be. That sounds a little scary to me. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think that'll ever become mainstream in like a, a Western country? Maybe in time. It seems like China and Japan, as far as kind of some of the stuff like this, they're like, you know, 10, 20 years ahead of the Western countries and will eventually adopt that. Um, the U.S. being being the slowest, seeing as we still use you know, swipe on credit cards and <laughs> maybe one day we'll catch up to you guys with our chips and tap to pay. But uh, I could see this this spreading maybe under the guise of convenience where you don't have to stop and pay for things. Or you don't have to, you know, I guess that's really the big thing is stopping and pay for things in any context, whether that's boarding a train or, or getting groceries from the grocery store. The store is just keeping track of what you pick up and it charges you when you step out of the store. <laughs> yeah. I think you're bang on. That's, that's exactly how it's going to infiltrate. If it is, it's going to be the, the promise of the convenience of mm -hmm. it. And uh, if it lives up to that, because, Everyone knows that everyone is just a sucker for convenience, really. But, man, how advanced would, would face detection need to be for anyone to roll that kind of technology out with any confidence? So to tie your face to your bank account and hope that it doesn't accidentally get triggered by someone like your brother, uh, that, would, that would take a lot of convincing, for me at least. That is one of the compromises, isn't it, of face ID? Because the odds of it... Um, matching just some random. I can't remember the stats when they announced it, but it was, it was like smaller odds than touch ID, except when it came to like your identical twin or a family relative. Right. And then it was a lot higher, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Um, because kind of the, your facial topology is, is really like the sum of the parts that you inherit. So it's, it's, you're going to have a very similar face, uh, especially to your siblings, and then maybe a little less so to your parents, and and then the opposite direction as well. And so a case like ad identical twins, it's, I think, uh, at least the way people were talking initially when Face ID came out, it seemed more likely than not your identical twin would be able to unlock your phone. Uh, but I haven't heard any updates on that in the last couple of years, whether or not people are still testing that, or if the fact I haven't heard anything about it means that maybe Apple's fine-tuned it a bit, that's not the case anymore. And there was the problem that people were like trying to get their twin or sibling to unlock it. And then when it didn't work, putting in the passcode and then like training the face ID on the wrong face. And then right. it would start yeah. working after that. That was a, um, yeah, a big asterisk on these sorts of tests when face ID first came out, I remember. Which was something that people weren't necessarily aware of uh, right at the start. So they didn't even actually realize they were kind of teaching the phone to do that. I guess if it becomes the thing to unlock your bank account, well, not to unlock your bank account because it kind of already is that, at least with banking apps. I mean, all the ones I use have Face ID already built in. Um, but actually, to authorize a payment, 
say just at a checkout. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it more secure to know that you might be able to use your sibling's account or if it was back to fingers that just some random somewhere in the world could authorize the payment? I mean, that's I'd argue kind that of, Touch that's- ID would be more secure in that case. And I think that's fair. That's kind of the case now, though. If someone took my phone, if my brother, I mean, my brother and I don't look that similar, but if, if we did and he took my phone, he could he could use my credit cards on there with Apple Pay. Um, so I think, I think the real security lies in having one device looking for one person's face. And if you're not that one person, it won't work. Um, I think it's a lot scarier when you do a general application where you have this, this, this massive camera system that's tracking everyone and it's trying to tell who everyone is um, because it's a lot harder to be precise in that case. Whereas you have one device really fine tuned to you specifically. Mm, yeah. Okay. I mean, you said Japan back then had, um, I mean, back then you back a few minutes ago, you said Japan had this <laughs> sort of thing. Was that in the article as well? Uh, no, I was making a broad statement that like okay. uh, some of the Eastern countries like China and Japan tend to be, you know, maybe 10 years ahead of us technology wise in general. Ah, gotcha. So yeah, I don't tend to group Japan in with China too often. They seem like somewhere between East and Western in my mind. Oh, really? Unless communist. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> so there's vending machines for everything in Japan. That's the coolest thing. Yeah. To yep. <laughs> um. Did you know in Japan you can buy Coke with extra fiber? Extra fiber? Uh huh. No, I did not realize that. I did know that uh, Coke has a uh, a coffee Coke uh, flavor that they only sell in in Japan, and I, I imported a can of coffee Coke uh, like maybe two or three years ago just to try it out. And uh, and how it, it, was ta- it? it tastes exactly like you would expect. <laughs> it tastes like <laughs> someone mixed coffee with Coke. <laughs> uh, okay, which which. Uh, was surprisingly not not terrible. It wasn't undrinkable, but it, it wasn't something I elected to to order more of. <laughs> not something you can see taking off in North America. Uh no, probably not. <laughs> I mean, Coke's already got the caffeine in it, so why do you need a coffee flavor? It just seems superfluous to the point of it. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because you would. I would assume that maybe the coffee comes with more caffeine then, because I wouldn't drink it for the flavor. <laughs> Yeah, Coke have tried all sorts of things like Coke with more energy, Coke plant-based sugar. Sure. Although their recent thing seems to be combating the all the news articles that are coming out saying that Coke is the biggest uh, polluter of the planet and that sort of. Oh, really? Biggest biggest producer of plastic or something like that, something along those lines. But every yep. ad I see from Coke now is how recyclable the bottles are and how environmentally friendly the company right. they're on. 100% damage control. Yeah, I see it's Coca-Cola named the world's most polluting brand in plastic waste audit. There we go. Thank you. That was just within the last couple of months. Man, that doesn't surprise me, especially when you consider all of not just Coke, which I think is probably the world's most popular soft drink. Uh, but then, of course, they have all the other companies like Dasani. They sell bottled water and uh, I, I don't know all their companies, but they do have other brands as well that are selling drinks. Right, yeah. 50% of the products, if not more, in a drinks fridge are produced by Coke. Right. Anyway, what was the topic? <laughs> we were talking about Face ID. Um, I'm not sure I have anything else to say on Face ID. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Apple's done a good job with, with their face scanning technology, and they still seem to be uh, in the lead as far as, as uh, face scanning to to do anything but especially in the in the realm of unlocking devices so uh it's cool to see them innovate in that way and i'm still very happy with face id and looking forward to the 2020 iphone which has dual biometrics (laughs) according to some sources we will see we will see ah so our friends over in new zealand finally have support for the apple watch cellular uh, I mean, well, they probably already had the cellular version there. Actually, would have they had it if it wasn't, uh, if it, if no service providers provided service for the cellular? Would they even have bothered selling it? I guess the question is, would Apple sell the cellular version that just doesn't have cellular enabled? Or would they make a special stainless stainless steel variant that just didn't have the cellular antenna at all? Considering, like, 
the SOS function is now an international feature and that requires cellular, then mm-hmm. I'd say they would have sold it anyway. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. It's probably cheaper for them too than to design a New Zealand specific watch. Mm. I mean, and they must have been working with some carriers to provide it as well. But, uh, yeah, hooray for <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> it's New so Zealanders. surprising to me uh, to hear that New Zealand is, is, is just now getting it. Um, yeah, this is the, probably the dumb American speaking, but when, when I, I group New Zealand <laughs> and Australia together and, you know, uh, in, in most things. So, <laughs> well, we don't, <laughs> I don't think New Zealanders do either. Yeah, that's fair. I'm sure it's just, just me, but it is fair that the rest of the world groups us together because there are <laughs> a lot of similarities and we are very close by. And right. New Zealand's not very big either. You guys should just uh, unify and form one big country. What would you call us? New Australia? <laughs> New Australia. Aussieland? Aussie land. Uh, there you go. You, you got to do it. All right. I'll have a chat with um, Jacinta, the uh, <laughs> prime minister. No, you, you, just, you just need to run for prime minister yourself. This is your, your campaign right here. Aussie land. Prime minister of New Zealand or Australia? Or of the uh, the, uh, the joint, <laughs> maybe thing. maybe maybe that's how it's going to happen. You you run independently uh, for prime minister of both, and you win. And then, as prime minister of both countries, you unify them. Or I just split off from the current um, mainstream governments and start my own government, which encompasses both countries. Kind of <laughs> like how like crazy tinfoil hat people move out into their sticks and then. Just like put a flag in the ground and call it independent, right? Do you have those? <laughs> oh yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, that's a worldwide thing. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Um, I thought we could. Oh, well, I put this topic in there not because I thought we would have a lot to say about New Zealand and cellular watches, but uh, just to talk about Apple watches in general because the topic doesn't come up very often at the moment. It definitely comes up once a year when new watches come out, but outside of that. There's not a whole lot happening in the Apple Watch world, is there? Uh, no, yeah, it's pretty quiet between uh, releases. Um, I guess Are if you we're still gonna... using wearing yours on the daily. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I feel naked without it, um, and I, I guess I do have some things to report as far as the Series Five goes. Uh, I know initially the Series Five got a lot of bad press in terms of battery life with the always-on screen. Um, and I don't know if it's been Watch OS updates or iOS updates or. I don't know. Uh, but my battery life has gotten significantly better. Uh, I'd say almost to the point that my Series 4 was at last year. So I think... That's, I think That's very good. Yeah. I think when we first talked about my Series 5, and it had been maybe a week that I'd had it, I had reported that as of recording the show, um, which is which is uh, in the evening for me, my watch was almost dead, and, and it was almost a struggle to get through a full day with it. Uh, but as of now... Um, my watch is still at 66%. So I, I would feel confident that I could get through a second day if I had to and, and did very light use with it. So you get through a second day with maybe, the always on screen. Yeah. Yeah. I've always, I've really always left that screen on. Yeah. Maybe it'd be closer to, uh, half a day. I don't know. It's not something I've actually ever tested, but, uh, I'm, I might feel comfortable well, going on a weekend trip without my charger. That sounds on par with my Series 3, which you generally gen- generously gave to me. I would <laughs> say I'd get, uh, yeah, comfortably a day and a half and probably two days. And that's with the screen off, of course, because it doesn't have the always-on screen. Yeah, right. so to have about the same with an always-on screen, yeah, and a crazy improvement. Yeah, and uh, for that to come mostly in just the, uh, the new display controller chip, uh, because... Outside of that, the Series 5 is, is almost completely unchanged from the Series 4 internally. Uh, and as far as the convenience of having always-on display, because you weren't a huge... You, know, you didn't find the always-off display, or not always, mostly <laughs> off display, to be a big inconvenience, did you? Uh, no, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't much of a frustration for me. Um, there's definitely moments where the always-on display has helped. Um, I know initially I kind of found it more more frustrating than anything. And I think it's because I don't know if Apple had changed something with their, their wrist raise detection or what. 
uh, but I'd raise my wrist and the always on wouldn't switch to like the full active mode. So I'd try interacting with the watch and it wouldn't let me cause it was still in kind of its low power mode. So I'd have to tap the screen to wake it up and then interact with it. Uh, and then I would have the opposite issue, which I think is what mostly contributed to the battery drain was I'd put my wrist down and the screen would stay on and I'd find, you know, even after having my wrist sitting on a desk for 10 minutes or something, I'd look down and see the screen is still in full brightness. And I think that was a big contributor to battery drain initially. Mm, yeah, and there were a lot of reports of similar sorts of things uh, when WatchOS uh, 6 was in like the 0. 0.0 and 0. 0.0.x release days. But it all seems to have stabilized now, uh, including for my watch. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy with it now. I still occasionally have this problem, which seems to have existed since WatchOS 1.0, in that sometimes when you raise your wrist, it takes like a fraction of a second to activate the screen and some people see this more than others but i know when it's working perfectly it just comes on instantly as soon Mm -hmm. as you raise your wrist but every now and then i just see that it waits just a little bit and that can be frustrating huh i know listening to um the talk show podcast with john gruber he had that with a few of his watches and i think that sounded like one of the main reasons that he doesn't wear the watch is because he's got this little delay but it sounds like he has it almost every time that he uses it. Um, so it's kind of worrying that, that that sort of thing still exists since watchOS 1 and we're at watchOS 6 now and <laughs> it still occasionally does the same thing. I don't know what's causing that, but well, yeah, it can be annoying. Well, moving forward, uh, whether or not Apple ends up fixing that issue, it's certainly less of an issue now that you can see your watch either way. <laughs> so all right, on screen is right. very helpful with that. Speaking of, uh, say, getting a watch for Yasmin, do you think like a Series 1 is still a a valid purchase in 2019, end of 2019? Um, Does the Series 1 support watchOS 6? Yeah, I think only... Oh, actually. I I thought... WatchOS 5 dropped the Series 0, didn't it? Right. Because it doesn't have things like activity sharing, uh, which came in... Uh, Or does it? Let's see, it says it will be compatible with Series 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So Okay, it's quite impressive. That is. I, I wouldn't trust it maybe to get WatchOS 7, though. Mm, no, that'd be surprising. So, What was the difference between Series 1 and Series 2? Um, I don't, I don't the, remember anymore. Wasn't it the 2 had the... Uh, so they both got the new processor over Series 0, um, but didn't the 2 have a GPS, whereas the 1 didn't get the GPS? I'm fairly sure that was the main difference. Mm. The main difference between Series 1 and 2 is the second generation uses a new display that's twice as bright at 1,000 Ah, yes, and that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Series 1 is splash resistant. Uh, I think the Series 2 is is waterproof. Although I wore my Series 0. Right. Everywhere, surfing, diving, in the shower every day, and never had an issue from... Day zero to day 364. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. GPS, waterproofing, brighter screen. That seems to be it. I think for the most part, uh, it'd be hard to go wrong with an Apple Watch. Uh, I know uh, it's one of those products where I don't necessarily worry about having the... I mean, I do because I'm crazy, but I wouldn't recommend it to most people to worry about maybe having the latest and greatest processor. Um, I'm sure there are apps that exist that use it. Uh, but I don't find a need really to use apps at all on my Apple Watch. It's great for notifications, quick text messages, uh, setting a timer or whatever Siri can do, but I don't download apps and feel the need to use them ever. Apps are the worst part of the Apple Watch, easily. Right. (laughs) Because if anything takes more than a second or two, firstly, you've got your, your arm and your wrist in this stupid position that gets tired very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're, you're probably waiting for something because even, well, I haven't experienced the latest watch, but but I, I can imagine that they're not like snappy fast, especially right. when it comes to networking type things. Um, yeah, if it takes more than a few seconds, then I'm not going to be doing it, more you'd than be, likely. You'd be better off to have your phone pulled out to do it than to wait on your watch. Right. The only time that I am doing something on the watch for more than a few seconds is when I like physically can't get to my phone and it's the only option. But Mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, probably even 49 times out of 50, I'm going to reach for my phone uh, unless all I needed to do was glance at something. 
Right. And uh, even for that limited use case, it's it's surprising to me how how nice it is to have the watch. Um, it is so nice, isn't it? Yeah, not not to have to pull your phone out every time it vibrates. It's kind of nice to be able to just glance at your watch, see it's not important, and get back to your life. Whereas pulling your phone out, it can be easy to get sucked into that or anything else. So uh, it's definitely a life improvement. Um, I think my biggest use case for the Apple Watch is um, in the case of like sitting in a meeting – uh, in an office space where you wouldn't want to pull out your phone, but I, I can get a message and, and quickly you know, tap a, a canned response uh, without uh, pulling my attention away from, from that meeting longer than I have to. And, and that's probably the main way I use my watch. I love canned responses. That's probably my uh, my biggest tip for anyone who just gets an app watch is don't rely on the default canned responses to messages. Like set up your own because yeah. it make life good. Like my top five are just emoji, I think, like happy face, laughing, thumbs up, thumbs down, something like that, and they can respond to to probably 95% of the messages that are incoming. (laughs) So, And even the the scribble-type keyboard, if you're sending a really short message that's just one or two words, it's it's very uh, easy and quick to do it that way as well. I try to use Siri on my watch, but honestly, it's not a good experience. It's more times than not, it's just frustrating. It often cuts me off mid-sentence or... Just completely mishears what I'm trying to say. Um, the raise to speak without saying Yo Siri works, I don't know, maybe 75% of the time. Certainly not enough to, to use it. Right. Um, it's, man, it's not a good experience in my books. Yeah, I, I very rarely use Siri, even for the, the interactions that could very easily be done, like setting a timer. I actually have a, a timer complication on my watch, and it's just two taps between hitting the timer app and then hitting the amount of time I want it to go. And that's so much faster than telling Siri, making sure she heard me right, and and then going from there. So what does your watch face look like at the moment? Uh, So my main watch face is the Meridian watch face, which I believe is, it might be in Series 4. I know it's only in the bigger watches. That's uh, It's the analog face that is square instead of circular. Uh, And I have four complications in the middle. One is, is my calendar. Uh, so I can see what events I have going on for the day. Uh, one is the temperature, so I can see current temperature and then the high and low for the day. Uh, one is a, a quick, it's my message app, so I can jump into messages. And the bottom one is my timer, to say quick timers. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Sounds pretty close to mine as well. I'm, I'm, I love the message complication. Because it, it's just a speech bubble with the number of messages you have remaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, and having that means I don't have to have the notification indicator, the red dot at the top, which... I intensely dislike. <laughs> so so that's disabled in favor of just the message bubble. Um, I've got... Uh, actually, I don't know what the face is called. Let, let me just have a quick look. It's, it's the activity analog face I've got. So uh, it's the circular analog watch face, but in the middle you've got your three activity circles, which I never look at. Okay. Uh, top right I've got temperature. Of course, I've got the date in the middle as well. And then the bottom long complication is the wind, which is critical in a uh, west australian summer to know what the wind's doing to know whether your house should be open or not really just because of sand or what just because of (laughs) do you want to boil all night long in a boiling hot house or do you want to have a nice breeze flowing through it really (laughs) yep (laughs) okay (laughs) so if, if you imagine like the days are like 35 degrees celsius plus and then like most afternoons around two or three you'll get the breeze change direction so instead of coming off the land it'll come off the ocean and it'll be like i don't know 10 degrees cooler so Mm. it's uh, it's it's key to know to knowing if unless you want to go insane man that is but between very hot and reasonable (laughs) based on this (laughs) (laughs) exactly that's the difference that's why it's important and i mean i could just walk outside and have a look at the trees or just feel the air and see if it feels cool or not but um right i'm out I mean, I have my, I have the temperature on the thing as well. I could always just go outside and feel that, but it's just nice to look at my watch while I'm inside. That's interesting to me to hear uh, a genuine use case because, like, the wind direction complication is, is one of those that I've seen went. Well, that's useless. No one's going to use that. <laughs> so, so man, before the wind complication existed, I was using third-party wind complications. Uh huh. That's how badly I wanted it on there. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting to hear a, a genuine use case for something like that. 
I think I was paying carrot actually because you have to be like tier two carrot weather subscriber to get that sort of complication on your watch. Oh man, you, I think you just reminded me to cancel my carrot subscription. <laughs> to cancel it? I don't use it. I, I got it. I'm like, oh, this is a cool app. I'm really going to, I'm going to go all in and try it out and subscribe to it. And then I still just use the default weather app and I haven't found a need to use carrot. Hmm. So the thing about the default app is it doesn't use the, uh, the government's weather source in Australia. Uh, it just uses some, I don't know, weather.com or something. Yeah, I believe that's the same here. Yeah, which might be all right in where you are because I'm guessing weather.com's an American company. But uh, the weather.com forecast, or well, maybe it's Yahoo Weather, I don't know. Uh, at least the forecast can be like five, six, seven degrees different from what it's actually going to be. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Yeah, it can be way off. Uh, so... I mean, it gives you a rough idea, but if you want to know some precise stuff, uh, then at the Bureau of Meteorology and Handily Carrot has that as an unlock option for eight dollars a year. Huh. I think I think I uh, I've never had a problem with with whatever weather sources Apple uses. It's accurate enough for me that I've I haven't been annoyed by it. Uh, the big selling point for me with Carrot, and and now that I'm looking at it again, just now I might keep it. Uh, the fact that it has a weather radar, I really like that. Uh, it's helpful when it's mostly just for big storms in general, uh, living in, in Kansas, famous for tornadoes and, and big storms. Uh, uh, when, when it's that time of year that we have some severe weather, being able to closely track, uh, clouds like that. And then, and then carrot has, you know, severe weather alerts in ways that Apple just doesn't. So, so now that you've reminded me and I see that I'm paying, you know, a little over a dollar a month for it, I'm probably not going to cancel it. <laughs> Oh, you should get the yearly one. It works out a lot cheaper if you're paying a dollar a month now. I'm uh, sorry. That, that, I am paying yearly. That's just my okay. estimation. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, of course, you can set it to, like, a homicidal um, personality with uh, communist tendencies and, <laughs> and just get, be thoroughly entertained every time you open it up. It does have way more customization options for, for small things like that than, than I've seen in most apps. So it's pretty hilarious. Uh, so Lightroom can now import directly from an SD card. So this was submitted by a very prolific redditor uh, with many, many tens of thousands of uh, karma. <laughs> I just I noticed it. that. <laughs> I submitted it to the iPad subreddit and also to the photography subreddit because it was kind of big news and uh, it seemed to have been missed. And previously, or at least since iOS 13, uh, what you could do with Lightroom Mobile uh, is it could kind of import using the Files app extension, mm-hmm. uh, but it was kind of a dog's breakfast. It wasn't a good experience. It was, you'd like select all, and then there was crazily there were like two buttons, open or done, and like what what's the difference between open and done? And they were like crammed up next to each other. It wasn't obvious what you had to do. I think open was the one you were supposed to press, but then the dialogue would disappear and nothing would happen, and then like. 30 seconds later, suddenly your photos would appear. So it was just nasty. But since uh, 13 point... Actually, it's supported since 13.2, uh, but the update to Lightroom came out right around when 13.3 came out. Um, but you plug in your SD card and you can just go into Lightroom, just click import, and it just reads off the SD card as if you were doing it on a, uh, a real computer, in quotes. <laughs> so for photographers out there who who do use Lightroom as part of their workflow, uh, which is me because my iPad's like my primary device. Mm -hmm. It has made life... uh, It's been a significant improvement to to my workflow. That's awesome. And it's really exciting to to think about what's going to happen in the coming years as as iPad OS opens up even more, uh, but especially as as apps start to really leverage all of of that openness that iPad OS offers. Uh, I think it's kind of kind of uh, foreshadowing the future of an even more uh, computer replacement uh, kind of device. And it's exciting that Adobe is kind of running with, well, you know, it's 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 got the baton held out front, it's right? In a in a lot of ways, I don't know of any other apps that can import directly from the SD card. I mean, besides Photos dot app on the iPad, yeah, Adobe's leading the way in a few different things. They seem to be full speed ahead in Photoshop mm-hmm. and bringing that. 
uh, even though it's a bit limited at the moment, but it's pretty early days. Um, Lightroom is regularly adding features from the desktop app. Quite sure if they're at feature parity, but they're not far apart. Um, and I don't know, Adobe has like a million other apps, which I don't use and don't even know <laughs> what they do. So, um, But uh, yeah, they seem to be all in on iOS for sure. And not just iPad, like even the iPhone in its, on my iPhone SE, like I've got nearly, I think every single feature that Lightroom on the iPad has, has, has been crammed onto the <laughs> iPhone SE screen as well, which oh, is kind man. of ridiculous, but also very handy when you just need to do a quick thing when you're out and about. <laughs> Sounds like a, a nightmare to try to do anything on that small of a screen. Uh, it's a, it's an experience, that's for sure that tiny and and smashed to bits and i couldn't i couldn't work on that (laughs) (laughs) i I was using my phone next to someone who was into tech the other day and he goes oh wow and i said yeah i know the the screen is crashed Uh, the screen is smashed he said no it's an iphone se he was more excited about that (laughs) (laughs) just the fact that someone was using an se yeah as excited if you just see someone like still using an original iphone out and about yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and then he gave me the argument for having the small screen size and that sort of thing. It's pretty cool. Right. I wish uh, Apple would, em- would embrace the iPad uh, as a desktop replacement as much as some of these companies like Adobe have. I would love to see uh, some version of Final Cut brought to the iPad. Uh, some, a, a, a version of Xcode on the iPad more than just the Playgrounds. Um, I think that Apple will be, uh, it'll be much easier for them to sell the idea of this being computer replacement if their own pro software is running on the iPad as well. Yeah. And to, to paraphrase a quote, which I don't know where it came from originally, but like a, a software platform isn't fully fledged until it's self-sufficient. So until an iPad can write iPad apps, then it's just an attachment to another computing platform really. Right. And I, I don't know how valid that is because I'm not a developer, but <laughs> but it sounds I, good. There's definitely merit to it, and and just the the idea of um, the no compromise development experience, where instead of uh, writing an app on a Mac and then running it in a simulator, uh, or if you're lucky enough to have a physical device running on that, but still having to use a simulator for every other screen size or OS version or whatever, the fact that you could write a write an app on the device. And then it it runs natively on that same device uh, with no emulation. Um, I mean, maybe you could emulate screen sizes with letterboxing or things like that. Uh, I, I think that would be an ideal experience for writing apps. Yeah, I think to write apps, the iPad's got to have a bigger screen size available. It's because it's got to be pretty limiting at the moment to have code on the screen and one or two sidebars. And then also the app itself that you're running. Although I, mean, I guess the app itself could be just, you know, the app launches into its own full screen thing. Right. And then maybe you have a, a debugging console running next to the app. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even in like a slide over. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely people that write apps on the 13 inch MacBook Pros. So I think the 13 inch iPad Pro uh it should be able to do it at least reasonably comfortably. I would love to see better um, uh, attached monitor options, though, for the iPad. Because currently, if you plug in a monitor, which became very doable with the USB-C iPad Pros, right? it runs in the iPad resolution on the monitor, which no monitors are really in. Mm-hmm. I can't, what is the resolution of the iPad? Is it 3 by 4 Certainly not uh, 16 by 9 16 by 10 Let's see. Like iPad most monitors. aspect ratio. Um, and not only that, but, uh, yeah, iPad displays are four by three. Okay. Um, not only that, but, uh, allowing, uh, like extending your screen versus just mirroring it, things like that could make it way nicer to develop with. Yeah. Extending, uh, independent resolution for the attached monitor, those two things. And I could, I could really see the iPad becoming even like a, uh, uh, like a, First, for someone who docks their their laptop most of the time, like mm-hmm. a replacement for that. Oh yeah, especially since you can attach a mouse and a keyboard. 
well, a mouse now in iOS 13. If the cursor is a little bit janky, it, um, <laughs> it's still pretty good. Yeah, I think I think that that is the direction we're heading uh, with this first version of iPad OS, really foreshadowing a future like that, where you can sit down and dock your iPad and and use it in a more professional environment. Um, that seems to be exactly what uh, what Apple's implying that they they think the future of the iPad is, and I'm really excited about it. The only thing that's stopping me from using a mouse with mine at the moment, my typical setup is just a keyboard plus touching the screen. Um, if the if the magic mouse would scroll, then I'd be all over that. But right. unfortunately, uh, there's no scrolling functionality with the magic mouse and the iPad. So, yeah, it just is more, I don't know, user-friendly, I guess, just to touch the screen and type when you have to type. You've got to imagine Apple has some kind of reporting going on behind the scenes, like how many people are actually using the, the cursor feature in iPadOS. And uh, I think if they see a high enough adoption rate, they're they're going to have to put more resources into, into fully fleshing out the idea of mouse support. So you're saying I should just keep using mine to, to <laughs> add to the statistics? <laughs> I mean, not necessarily. I'll just, I'll just leave it paired and in my pocket so it jiggles around all the time. <laughs> This is what we do. We, we're going to leverage the whole uh, Apple Show community. Everyone start pairing your, your mice to your iPads, and they'll get 12 more people on their charts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, the final topic, which is actually the first topic, but I just jumped over it, um, <laughs> is that iFixit has reported on the MacBook Pro teardown ability. Uh, the Mac the Pro. The quote is... Beautiful, amazingly well put together, and a masterclass in repairability. So, just as Apple promised, it was modular, not in quotes, but it is truly modular, even more modular than I think some people, more modular than some people expected. Yeah. I think they only gave, was it two criticisms, uh, that the SSDs custom made by Apple's and paired, I think, with the T2 chip, um, but of course, you can you can add SSD storage to it a number of other ways. So, right. it's barely a downside. Um, there was another uh, the CPU. I think they said was a little bit hard to get to, but uh, I don't know. That's a pretty major upgrade. Uh, and the one last downside uh, is the just the fact, just the documentation, and the fact that some things that were easily user replaceable were noted down as take it into Apple to have it done. Uh, besides that, it seems to be pretty much thumb screws and latches, and you can do whatever you want to the machine. Right. And uh, uh, since I've been working on my my Mac Pro over the last couple of weeks, uh, it's it's really cool to see uh, how much inspiration. I mean, it, even from from the outside, just looking at the case, you can see that they drew a lot of inspiration from their older Mac Pro. Uh, but I hadn't necessarily worked on one. Uh, I've never worked on one. I've seen the insides before, uh, but to do so and see that there's no screws on anything. If you want to, if you want to replace uh, the, the CPU, it's literally just a tray that slides out and you slide a new one. in. if you want to replace the GPU, there's a thumb screw and a latch that you undo and you can, and, and it's just, it's amazing how easy it was back then. And it's really cool to see them uh, reintroduce that with this year's model. I really like the fact that the securing mechanism for all the PCIe slots is just one slider. So one screw slide it, they're all unlocked and you can jiggle them around as you see fit instead of having a single screw for every single slot, which right. is the case in, in a lot of PCs. And, and that was the same case in, in the older Mac Pros as well. So uh, yeah, that kind of convenience and, and really thought about the, the end user in that way is, is something we haven't seen from Apple in a really long time. It seems like also the wheels and the feet are easily removable just mm-hmm. with a, a Torx screw. Uh, so maybe there will be an aftermarket of uh, third-party wheels available. <laughs> if you want to pay $400 for them. Yeah, this is a, a, a really impressive computer all around, not just repairability-wise, but watching... Uh, tech reviewers and, and professionals both trying it out and uh, just being blown away by what they can do with it is it's it's inspiring to me, uh, but in 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 such a 
I don't know, a, a non-physical way because I, to think of all the creativity that's unlocked with a computer that's powerful makes me want one. But I know that I, I couldn't even, you know, begin to, to fully utilize the power of a Mac pro. Whereas, uh, you know, a, a five year old computer will, will easily handle all the, all the work I do for the most part, at least. Um, it kind of makes me sad that I, I'm not a target audience for a computer like this. I, I think 80% of the fun for us is just like setting up or configuring or building it, even if it is. That's right. Like <laughs> 2010 Mac Pro. Order. Which uh, year do you have again? Uh, mine is a 2010, yeah. Yeah, the 2010. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. 80% of the fun is actually, you know, buying the components and getting it in there and researching it and making sure you've got the optimal build and best bang for your buck that's right yeah that's where i have the fun i'll let the creatives do the boring part (laughs) and and speaking of of bang for your buck uh this mac pro that i've i've been using and building up uh the 2010 it it's incredible to me uh how well it runs still uh uh at this point it's it's not the computer I bought in almost any sense, except for the ca- the case that it came with. Um, I've I've I doubled the RAM to thirty two gigs. I uh, upgraded the CPU. I went from the quad core three point two gigahertz to I I ordered a a six core uh, three point four six gigahertz Xeon uh, from eBay, and then the seller sent me the six core three point three three gigahertz variant. Um, which is disappointing, but still much faster than the CPU I got, and I got half the money back from the seller. So it ended up being a really good deal anyway. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, so that ended up being perfect for me still. Um, I upgraded the GPU to an RX 580, which the RX the 580X is what comes in today's Mac Pro. So to have basically a new GPU with, with 8 gigabytes of VRAM and... And uh, full metal support is incredible. I've I've replaced the wireless uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth with with uh, a modern uh, Wi-Fi AC chip and Bluetooth 4.0, uh, and even put a long range antenna on the back uh, in one of the PCIe slots so that I can get uh, good Bluetooth coverage. Uh, I've I've put in six terabytes of RAID storage and and. Uh, I did a little bit of fiddling to get Catalina to run on it because it's not officially supported, but there's no reason it shouldn't be because it runs at, at you know, perfect, perfect speed. The CPU is barely, barely under any uh, pressure to run it. And, and then my end goal of this was uh, if I could still use Xcode and, and write modern a- apps with Swift UI, uh, I'd consider it a success. And I've been able to do that super easily. I've been playing around making uh some watch apps with Swift UI uh, just this last week, and it and it, I've been I have the Xcode running and a simulator of every of every Apple Watch running all at once, and it doesn't care; it runs perfectly. Wow, those simulators tend to use a lot of uh, resources, so that's impressive. Yeah, I, I saw you tweeted at um, Will, or not at Will, but you an Apple Watch question. Um, so, are you going to uh, share your, your whatever you're building with us? <laughs> It's a uh, it's it's not very impressive. Um uh it's a it's a tool for for singers. Um so uh at least in barbershop and I know some other uh competitive singing ensembles settings um before before everyone sings they uh, blow a, a pitch pipe so everyone can get in tune with each other. I thought wouldn't it be nice if the pitch pipe was on your wrist. <laughs> and so I just more as just a test. Uh as writing a Swift UI app, I, I made a, a an app I call Wrist Pipe uh, <laughs> that uh, that uh, simulates wrist pipe on your wrist, and I really wanted it to simulate the old contact picker UI that Apple used uh, for digital touch, uh, whereas you you spin the scroll wheel and the selector uh, spins around a circle to choose the pitch, and then of course you would you would tap the middle to play it, and so that's that was one of my test apps that i made will you be publishing it uh i'm I'm considering it i have a i have a developer account uh and it's more or less fleshed out so you may as well then (laughs) yeah uh maybe if i do a little bit cleaning up and and uh 
have some extra time, I'll, I'll go ahead and publish it. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, do you have any fears about Catalina running on, uh, on the, on the Mac pro seeing as it's kind of not an officially supported hardware for it? Uh, f- fear isn't the right word. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a headache. Um, I, th- I think the day after I used a patching tool to, to get Catalina running on my Mac pro, uh, an update to Catalina was released and, uh, I can't just run the software update through Apple. I actually have to download the new version of Catalina into the, the patching tool and let it patch it. And then I have to, uh, put it, put it as a bootable flash drive and then boot to it on my Mac pro and then, and then write that software update to the hard drive. And it's kind of a mess. And so I can see a bit of a headache if I feel the need to update my versions of Catalina, which I'm going to try to avoid for the most part. Uh, but as far as like compatibility or Apple shutting anything down, I'm, I'm not really worried about that. As a matter of fact, when I was going through the, the update process um, on the App Store, the first thing I had to do was get the new graphics card that supports Metal uh, so that I could upgrade to Mojave because uh, otherwise you're not allowed to do that. But after I did that, uh, and Catalina was the next update in the App Store. Actually, the App Store itself said your Mac is compatible with Catalina. Uh, it wouldn't let me. So it wouldn't. It just got no idea. <laughs> Must have a very simple check. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't actually let me run it. Uh, but uh, it was it was very easy to put on, and uh, I can't I can't imagine that that Apple's gonna prevent that. Oh, that was another thing I added. Now that I'm thinking about it. I put USB 3.0 ports on it with a PCIe. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it it feels completely modern in in every way. So at least when you need to install uh, macOS from a flash drive, it's uh, doing it really quickly. Uh, <laughs> it would theoretically <laughs> if I owned a USB three point flash drive. Oh, uh, what you don't? I don't think I've bought a flash drive in like ten years. <laughs> <laughs> I actually bought one the other day. It's like one of those double header ones, like USB two on one side, or not? Uh, no, USB uh, A on one side, USB. C on one side, of course, both the USB three. Oh, nice! But it's kind of handy now that the iPad supports external floor storage. It's like it's it's reuseful. I feel like yeah. I've gone back in time. I guess I've uh, <laughs> I've just relied on AirDrop for everything like that, uh, and that was the big reason I needed to upgrade the wireless card in the Mac Pro is so that I could use things like AirDrop because uh, that's my main way of transferring files. Um, but yeah, just back on Catalina. I think once you've reached like some like a level of stability with uh, Mac OS and the Mac pro that you're happy with. Mm-hmm. I think you could probably just like, just sit on it for, for years because it's not like we're seeing massive changes coming to Mac OS every year. I'm like, even Catalina doesn't have too many compelling features. Uh, although like for, if you're doing developing work on it, then maybe like uh, improvements to um, Swift UI and Catalyst could be, compelling but um in terms of like just general user facing features it's not like they're coming thick and fast anymore right yeah i think the general trend of apple is that i actually think catalina was a bigger update uh the ability to run catalyst apps is a big one whereas if i was stuck on mojave there's a lot of things that i just wouldn't be able to do um whereas i think catalina is kind of like a version one of of being able to run catalyst apps and things like that and i think i've got a good you know, three years or so before there's the next big change that I'm going to have to get a new computer to support, probably. Oh, the odds of someone hacking something together to run, um, what are we calling it, Uh, Death Valley (laughs) next year or in three years or whatever, are probably pretty high as well. Right. Uh, I'm sure there's a lifespan to this this Mac as well, though. Uh, I think the only way I could make it any faster is, is... to put a second version of the CPU I have in it. There's, there's dual CPU variants for this CPU trace. Um, but even then, you know, I'm, I'm kind of maxed out in, in terms of like single core performance. And so it's definitely, you know, on the downward slope in terms of its life now, whereas even if I could get it to run it, it's not going to run it as well as I would hope. Um, th- this project of yours really inspired me to start looking for a Mac Pro of my own, right? Uh, okay. What I discovered is that uh, if you're looking on the local classifieds, uh, Gumtree, uh, people don't know what a desktop computer is in, compared to a laptop computer. Uh, people <laughs> don't know the difference between a Mac Pro and a MacBook Pro. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, In fact, you could find pretty much anything uh, with the word Mac in it uh, in the Mac desktop category. Um, But none of them were Mac Pros. Huh. The best thing I found was a uh, a Power Mac. Oh, man. That's a little old. I was like... It was like the one valid product in the entire category as well. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the number of people selling MacBook Pros, uh, called Mac Pros, in the desktop subcategory mm-hmm. <laughs> was uh, astonishing. Man, it's, it might be it's, a good place to pick up a cheap laptop sometime. Yeah. It's, it's so hard to buy used Apple products uh, because uh, Apple products do retain their value really well. Um, but but people really, in their minds, exaggerate what that means. Uh, you know, it's like, I, w- I wouldn't mind picking up a, a newer Mac Mini or, uh, you know, like a five-plus-year-old iMac, a small one or something, to set up for the kids to play games on. Uh, it doesn't need anything new or fancy. And, and people still want, you know, five, seven hundred dollars for these computers that are ten years old and, like, mm. Core 2 mm-hmm. Duo iMacs. Uh, and, and like, you know, like, don't lowball me. I know what I have. And <laughs> it's like, you clearly, you clearly don't know. You have a 10 year old computer. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's frustrating in that way. Uh, just to see how many, what people think computers are worth and, and to see them sit on, on the, like the Facebook marketplace for, for weeks. And then you send them an offer that's like in the reasonable range. And like, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think about taking that. I'm like, okay. And their computer is still there on there weeks later. And they're just, but anyway. Yeah. That's the state of classifieds. (laughs) Yeah. Always has been, always will be. (laughs) That's fair. It's probably just because Apple products, the one thing I know the value of, I can, uh, I can just, at least we don't have to like call a random number out of the newspaper anymore. Oh yeah. I, uh, I I rented my my very first house that way by calling a random classified ad. Oh, nice. (laughs) It was not nice. (laughs) (laughs) So. Leave that story for another time, hey? (laughs) Okay. Well, I'm James VDM on Reddit and Twitter. And I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. Uh, And we have a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash the r apple show. And congratulations again to Bassment Work. (laughs) <laughs> I think that's what we're going with for the pronunciation. All right. We're not basement work. Uh, David will send you a PM to organize uh, the sending out of the AirPods Pro. Yeah. And and thanks, everyone, for all the nice messages. It was really awesome to see how many people actually do enjoy the show. Yeah, that was definitely the best part of this comp was just getting all those nice messages um, on the post on the subreddit. <laughs> yeah, keep them coming. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> I need validation.